George Sada was a successful businessman and together with his wife, Jenny, had ten children. On that fateful night, in Fayetteville, West Virginia, only nine children were home. It was the night before Christmas, in 1945, the entire family were happily anticipating Christmas the next day. Although one of them was missing, 21-year-old Joseph Sada, who was serving in the army. Not all children are grown adults. Some of the youngest ones were Martha, 12 years old, Jenny, 8 years old, and Betty, 5 years old. Marion, 17 years old, was the eldest daughter in the family. She was looking over the children. George and his two sons, 23-year-old John, and 16-year-old George Jr. had already gone to bed. The youngest two sons, 14-year-old Maurice and 9-year-old Louis, were instructed to perform some last minute's farm duty before bed. Before leaving Martha in charge of the three girls, Jenny took her youngest child, Sylvia, to bed. By all accounts, the family was a happy high-functioning one. The kids were well taken care of. George and Jenny were happily married. There was no fighting and shouting as you would expect from a large family like this. But something troubling may be lurking around the corner. At 12.30 p.m., Jenny woke up from sleep to a strange call. The person on the other side asked Jenny for a name that she never heard before. Thinking it was the wrong number, Jenny informed the woman, only to hear a quote, weird laugh, followed by some sounds of glasses clinking in the background. It was the night before Christmas, so it makes sense that a lot of people would be celebrating. Without further questioning, the woman hung up the phone and Jenny, although slightly spooked, shrugged her shoulders and went back to bed. On the way to bed again, Jenny realized that the lights were still on, the front door was slightly ajar, and the curtain was still open. It was an odd sight because the children always take care of these home duties before heading to bed in the attic. This would be an important detail so remember this. Jenny again shrugged her shoulders and assumed that the children were tired. They must have forgotten to do these things because they are too excited about tomorrow. Jenny reminded herself to give the children a lecture the next day about remembering to lock the door. Marion had fallen asleep in the living room. The children were nowhere in sight. Jenny rolled her eyes and placed a blanket over Marion. About half an hour after Jenny fell asleep again, she woke up to the sound of something hitting the roof above her head. She looked over at her husband, George, who was still sound asleep. Jenny replayed the sound in her head. It sounded like a heavy rubber ball. She then heard the ball rolled off the roof before hitting another surface with a thud. She contemplated getting out of bed to check but sleep soon overtook her. Since there was no more noise, she thought it was the right thing to do. She'll forever regret that choice. About half an hour after, Jenny woke up once more. This time, to the smell of smoke. She got out of bed and realized that George's study was on fire. Jenny woke George up in a panic. George scrambled to get their two eldest sons up. In the meantime, Jenny woke up Marion and gave baby Sylvia to her. Take Sylvia to safety, she said to Marion. John, the eldest, claimed that he went to the attic and shook them awake, but his story would change. A critical piece of evidence. We don't know which version of the event was true. George, Jenny, John, Marion, Sylvia and George Jr. got out of the burning house but they watched in horror as the house was caught up in the blazing fire. The entire first floor was engulfed in flame. There was simply no way to get into the house through the front door again. So, the family tried to enter the attic from the ladder that was always kept leaning on the side of the house. Except, the ladder was nowhere in sight. George had the idea to use the truck as a ladder, but when he tried to start the truck, it wouldn't start. The truck was working perfectly the day before. There was nothing else left for them to try, and they watched on. In 45 minutes, the fire was over. And the house had collapsed. World War II had just ended months ago, and the firefighting department was severely understaffed. Due to this, the fire truck arrived hours after the flame had been subdued. It was no use. At around 10 a.m., the chief firefighter announced that the five Sada children had perished in the fire. He explained that the children's bones had been grounded into ash by the fire. The fire was determined to be caused by an electrical error. On January 2, 1946, the funeral for the five children was held. 
although George and Jenny never attended the funeral, having been too grief-stricken. However, through the grief, George and Jenny began to piece together what really took place. Was it really a fire? George and Jenny found the ladder that was always kept on the side of the house, near the window to the attic. It was found down an embankment twenty meters away. Who had put the ladder there? Not only that, Marion had run to a neighbor on that night of the fire. But when they tried to call the fire department, the line was dead. Someone else also tried to call the fire department from a tavern located not far from the house, but he couldn't get through either. A neighbor had to drive to the fire station to get the firefighters on the scene. It was later discovered that the phone line had been cut. But why would anyone do such a thing in the middle of brutal winter? George also had a hunch that his trucks fell into the hands of someone conniving, because what are the chances that both trucks would fail to start? Strangely, neighbors reported seeing someone lurking in the area, with a piece of equipment used to remove car engines. This person admitted to also cutting the phone line. He said that he was trying to cut the power line, not the phone line. You think this would be enough ground to arrest this suspicious man, but no, no one prevented him from leaving the scene. And there are no official reports made of who this person is. There are also sightings of people throwing what looked like fireballs at the house. All these clues, the unlocked door, the open curtain, the removed ladder, the possibly sabotaged trucks, and witness sightings of suspicious characters— all point to the possibility that someone planned the entire thing in order to abduct the Soder children. But who would do this? There are a few theories. George Sada was known for publicly criticizing an Italian dictator called Benito Mussolini. This dictator was later assassinated in April 1945. Although Sada lived in America, miles away from where the center of conflict, there were many Italians who supported Mussolini and living in America at the time, and they weren't shy about letting George know about their hatred for him. It's speculated that maybe a group of them decided to teach George Sada a lesson by kidnapping his children. A few weeks before the fire, an insurance salesman knocked on the Sada door, and when George refused to buy the insurance, the salesman told George that his home will be caught on fire and his children will be destroyed for the things he said about Mussolini. An oddly specific thing to say. This same salesman was one of the juror that decided the house fire was caused by a faulty wire. One of the older boys had also seen a suspicious car parked near the home days before Christmas that year. The people in it were especially interested in the youngest Sauter children. George and Jenny Sauter were convinced that the couple's five missing children were still alive. This belief only strengthened as people from all over the country reported seeing the missing children. One of the women saw the five children in a car being driven quickly away from the scene of the fire. Of the fire. Another woman saw the five children in a hotel with a few adults the morning after the fire. And yet another report came in of a woman who saw four of the five kids at a different hotel shortly after with four other adults of Italian heritage. She tried to speak to the kids but one of the Italian men became confrontational so the children stopped speaking and they moved on from the scene. The woman claimed that the man spoke something to her in Italian although she couldn't tell what he said. This case got so huge that FBI sent agents over to investigate but the local police department and fire department frustrated, George and Jenny hired people to dig through the remnant of the house themselves, only to find a piece of vertebrate. They sent the bone for testing and it was concluded that the bone belonged to a human male, but too old to be any of the missing children. The bone has also never been exposed to fire. Has someone planted the vertebrate? Much like someone else planted a fresh cow liver at the site to try and pass it off as the remains of the kids? Certainly possible. One of the last attempts at finding their children was through a billboard asking if anyone has seen the Sada children. The billboard stated an award of $10,000 if the children are found, dead or alive. In 1967, about 20 years after the event, Jenny received an envelope containing something that may have been the closest thing to closure that she could find. The envelope contained a picture of a young man in his thirties. The envelope was from Kentucky but didn't have any return address. The back of the photograph had the words, Louis Sauter, written, along with a cryptic message that George and Jenny could not read. They were convinced that the man in the picture was their missing son, Louis. Perhaps, 
It was enough of a closure for George because he died the following year in 1968. Jenny Sauter continued mourning until the day she died. Four of the five surviving children continued the search for their lost siblings. John did not join in on the continuous search. If you remember, John was the sibling who claimed to have shook the children awake but changed his story later. Was it out of guilt for not actually waking the children or was it out of guilt for his potential involvement in their disappearance? We don't know. The last surviving member of the Sauter family, Sylvia, died in April 2021 at age 79. She did not have strong memories of her five missing siblings since she was still a baby at the time, but she has contributed efforts to the search as well. There are a lot of theories about what happened, mostly surrounding George's potential mafia ties. The number, 90,132, written on the back of the photo can be tracked to an old zip code in Sicily. This may be some stretch, but a lot of evidence does point to mafia involvement. One possible way to solve this mystery is to have the descendants of the Sada family take a DNA test and upload their DNA to a worldwide database where anyone related to the family can be notified. If the five missing Sada children survived the fire and lived their lives elsewhere, they may have kids whose DNA could link them back to their lost relatives. There could still be hope of locating the lost five siblings. Although, probably not alive. But what do you think? Leave your theories in the comments below. Thanks for watching. For more mysteries like this, please check out this video. I'll see you there.